everyone, and welcome to today's Office Hours. My name is Shakib Rahman, and I'm an architect on the Oracle Apex team, uh, and we've got an exciting session for you today. So to get started, I'll start with a few uh, updates and announcements first. First, you can always go and watch the replay of the uh, previous Office Hour session on uh, the Apex website. Just go to apexoracle.com slash office hours, uh, and you'll see links to all of the videos. The last session was all about developer tips from the Apex team. Uh, and I think that you know there's something really there for everyone. I also want to talk about the next office hour sessions that we're planning. So uh, and next week in February 24th, we have a session on uh, in Spanish on how you can build a shopping cart application in the Apex service. Uh, and then on the 17th of March, exactly a month from today, we'll be having another series on developer tips from the Apex team. There's also a number of in-person conferences that are happening uh, this year. So I just want to point them out as well. Uh, there's Apex Alpha Adria that's happening in Slovenia in uh, April 22nd. There's Apex Connect that's happening in Germany uh, in the first week of May. Uh, and there's also the Casco conference uh, happening in June. I want to share a few updates, uh, a few service updates for Apex Autonomous Database. So one, uh, this is very recent. Uh, the autonomous database and Apex service customers can now make outbound web service calls from Apex to private endpoints within their VCN. Uh, this is a requested feature for, for a lot of uh, customers, and now it's available. In terms of Apex 21.2 upgrades, they will begin in early March for autonomous database and Apex service customers. Uh, as always, you can learn more about these updates and stay up to date by visiting this short URL, uh, apex.oracle.com slash go slash adb dash updates. I also want to talk to you about the next patch that's available. So Apex 21.2 patch set bundle three is now available. Uh, it was last updated on January 31st, 2022. Uh, and when this patch has been applied, your Apex product version will be updated to 21.2.3. Of course, you can download this from my Oracle support and you can visit the known issues by going to apex.oracle.com slash known issues. I also want to take a moment to introduce some of the newest members of the Oracle Apex product development team. So first, we have uh, Karina Pastor. Uh, she's joining us from Brazil in Sao Paulo. Uh, and also, we have Rupesh, uh, who's joining us in India. Uh, and this really adds to our uh, product management team, uh, which is here. And these are the folks, these are the go-to people on the Apex team that you can reach out to if you have questions about Apex, if you're looking for uh, you know, content, collateral, uh, support, uh, you know, these are the folks that will be able to help you point you in the right direction on all things Apex. And you can also see their Twitter handles uh, below their names. As always, if you have an idea for how we can make Apex even better, please go to apex.oracle.com slash ideas. Uh, and this is a website that we've, uh, this, this is an Apex application we've put up uh, and it's been getting a tremendous response and we've been really seeing like really, really good ideas come there. So please go there. You don't have to have an idea to post. You can also just go there and you know, look at the comments, you know, add, add your own, uh, you know, thoughts and vote features up. Uh, it really helps us get sort of gauge what is, uh, you know, uh, you know, important from a community perspective. All right. With that being said, uh, for today's session, uh, it will be an extension. It'll be really part two of the previous session we had on vanity URLs for Apex and ORDs uh, on autonomous database. So this will be presented by Todd Botker, who's a director of product management on the Oracle database team. Uh, and I think you're going to learn a lot from the session. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Todd. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Shakib. Uh, let me set up my screen sharing here. And all right. Uh, so as Shakib mentioned, my name is Todd Botker, and I am a product management director here in the database tools team at Oracle Corporation. So today I'll be showing two extensions to the vanity URL architecture that was introduced at my last Apex Office Hours. Uh, this was back in November, so not too long ago. That recording is available at our Office Hours site. If you have seen that, uh, I believe you will find this part two, this follow-on session, very interesting as well. And uh, even if you're new to all of this or you just have a general interest in things like Apex and Oracle REST data services, autonomous database, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI as we call it, 
then I think this presentation will be interesting for you as well. I, I believe you'll find it rewarding, uh, so please do stick around. All right, with that introduction, let's jump right in. And by way of agenda, uh, I will begin with a brief public service announcement about APEX on Autonomous Database. Um, Shakib, Shakib already mentioned it. We have a big um, upgrade of APEX coming. So I'm gonna give you some tips for that. Then I will show two optional extensions to the Autonomous Database Vanity URL architecture that was introduced last time. Now I think I've planned this so there's time at the end for Q&A so we can take some questions. Regarding the multiple vanity URLs, someone asked specifically about this at our last session. And um, as, you, as you may recall, I, I basically said, no, don't do multiple vanity URLs right now. Uh, if you want a second vanity URL, do it on a separate or a second autonomous database. But I also said, stay tuned for more news. We've got more coming here. So this is my follow up on that, where uh, in the meantime, we, we have identified and tested, and uh, I'm staging up a blog post all about this soon as well. We have identified and tested the configuration for multiple vanity URLs on the same autonomous database. So we'll be showing that in some detail. Regarding the expanded vanity URL lockdown, we started down this path at the end of the last session and ended up cutting it a little short. Uh, I showed some simple rules that you can deploy in your load balancer sitting in front of your autonomous database that will block access to developer and administrator tools such as Apex Admin Services, Apex App Builder at the vanity URL. So it'll block them at the vanity URL. It allows you to kind of tighten things up and lock certain things down. So here I'll elaborate on this topic further. And by the end, you'll have a more comprehensive view of what you may want to do to, to kind of lock things down and how would you configure that? Uh, lastly, before we move on, I wanna emphasize that both of these vanity URL extensions are optional. There's no strict requirement that you configure any of this. In fact, you may have good reasons to not configure certain things and you know that's fine. But I, I do believe these extensions will be of interest and useful to a wide audience who may be thinking about running Apex on autonomous database. Okay, so let's start with this public service, this public service announcement. Uh, this uh, autonomous database is an autonomous service. We take care of upgrading things like Apex for you. And we typically do that twice per year. We do a significant upgrade of Apex twice per year. Before doing that, we send out advanced email notifications. So you get a heads up that this is coming. There's not anything you necessarily have to do. Uh, again, we, we do the upgrade, but we want to make you aware of what's coming. That typically you'll receive a notification one to two weeks in advance. And those notifications will be sent to the contact email addresses we have on file for the autonomous database instance. There's an area in autonomous database where you can enter the contacts uh, who you want to be notified. I believe we also send it to the OCI tenancy administrator email address that we have on file too, just to cover, cover the basis. Uh, so keep an eye out for some advanced email notifications in this regard uh, coming soon. Those email notifications will contain uh, a date. When your actual upgrade day rolls around, when your upgrade day comes, developers who are in Apex, they're logged in to workspaces and working on Apex apps, they'll see notifications displayed so the developers aren't caught off guard. Um, and this is new, we've added some new notifications. I've got a couple of screenshots of that coming, but we're giving some signals to the developers, hey, an upgrade's coming very soon. Developers get a signal, they can save their work and so forth, and they kind of have a better sense for what's going on. If, if you go access Apex um, during this exact window where the upgrade is being finalized, uh, and typically that's less than five minutes, but if you're acting, accessing Apex during that window, you may see your dev tools briefly become read-only, uh, or you may see Apex itself briefly become inaccessible, and you'll see a little message box to that effect. Uh, we've got we've tried to get this down to as short a window as possible. Um, it's typically less than five minutes uh, of this upgrade window uh, twice per year, but but be aware that um, you know, your developers in particular 
they, they can get irritated by this. So we give them a heads up, make them aware that there may be a brief couple minute window on this upgrade day where the dev tools are read only. And for administrators, for, you know, for Apex administrators, administrators of the instance, you have the option where you can go and defer your upgrade 45 days beyond your upgrade date. We give you the option to do this for app testing purposes. And this is useful for uh, very complex Apex apps, very mission critical Apex apps that you do want to explicitly test before taking the upgrade, before the upgrade comes along. Now, as we know, the vast majority of Apex apps out there in the world are, are pretty simple and run across major upgrades without any modifications uh, quite nicely. In fact, we have Apex apps out there. I saw a tweet about this. We have one Apex app that's been running for 13 years continuously across upgrades without any modification. So that is the more typical case. But for very complex stuff or, and or mission critical stuff, we do recommend taking the time to do some testing before the upgrade hits. And someone asked me recently, what do we mean when we say complex app? So, um, we don't have a precise scientific definition for that, but if you have an app that's using a very broad swath of Apex functionality, you have an app that's doing a lot of custom stuff, maybe you're doing a lot of PL SQL scripting, uh, you have an app and an environment where Apex third-party Apex plugins are being used, perhaps you're doing some client-side JavaScripting and you've got some JavaScript libraries that need to be kept up to date and you know, things like that. If you're doing any or all of those things, I'd say there's a chance you fall into that minority of apps that are more complex in nature. And yes, we do recommend you do some testing before the upgrade hits. Okay, so if you're an administrator, you have this option to defer for 45 days. It gives you an extra window to do app testing. And I provided a few details on this below. What you can do is you can take your autonomous, and this is very easy in autonomous database. This is one of the strengths of autonomous database. With a, with a button click, you can clone the entire thing. Your database, your data, your Apex apps that are in the database, you can clone the entire thing, allow the clone to upgrade on schedule, and then test your Apex app against the new Apex release there. So it's a very, way to do that, very easy way to do this without even leaving autonomous database. Just take a clone, let it upgrade, test there. And then on your original autonomous database that you cloned from, you select this option to defer by uh, up to 45 days. And I'll show you a screenshot of that in a minute. So the administrator can go in and select this to give you the extra time. Then of course, once the uh, testing is done, you can go back to your original ADB. And when you're confident, everything's fine. Even for complex apps, it is often the case you don't need to make any changes. But once you've reached that level of comfort, that level of confidence, there's a link you can click to start the Apex upgrade now, or you can just let it occur at the 45 day mark. And you can go back and delete that cloned ADB when it's no longer needed. So you're not, you're not paying extra for another instance. Uh, typically this can be done in a day or two. So it's, you're not paying a lot of extra and you can clean up that clone. So more and more customers are doing this. It's, there are other ways to go test an app in other environments uh, outside of autonomous database if you like to do that but here's a quick and easy way to do it without ever leaving autonomous database and as Shakib mentioned uh, take a look at this url keep an eye on this this is where we post service updates about autonomous database uh, there's a little banner there right now that says expect this in march uh, so it's coming yeah, any any new news or updated news would appear on that page Okay, uh, so just a second here, make sure my phone is off. Okay, so that's our, our big public service announcement. We've got a major upgrade coming soon. When we think you'll really like all the stuff that's new in Apex uh, 21.2, maybe you've fooled around with it elsewhere outside of autonomous database. There's a lot to love in this new release. This is a quick screenshot of where you go in Apex admin services to do this 45 day setting. Uh, at the bottom right, you see a thing that says available updates. You can click on that little gear icon and you'll get a dialogue. This is where you say, yes, I want the 45 days of extra time or no, I don't necessarily need that. And this is kind of intended to be a one-time setting, uh, set it once, 
and then forever after, you just know you get 45 extra days. You can, of course, turn it off if you like. Uh, I can go back in here later and turn it off. But if you think you're, you fall in this category where you want to do the extra testing, go, go here and select yes. Uh, pretty straightforward to do. And then uh, once the upgrade is available and you're in this 45-day window, you'll get a link where you can go apply the upgrade immediately after you've completed your testing. And this is a couple screenshots of the new developer notifications. So you've got developers in your workspaces working on apps on your upgrade day. Uh, you know, we're, we're giving you some better tips about what's going on. The first one on the top right says the upgrade's available. It's hit the pod where your autonomous database is running, and it's going to start uh, very soon unless you've elected to get 45 extra days. Uh, and the bottom left, is another message that we show where uh, this is while the upgrade is actually being finalized and you're in that five minute or less window, typically five minutes or less. And this is a little message saying, you know, hey, this is what's going on. And the, the developer tools may be in read only mode during this period. Okay, so that's, that's it for the public service announcement. Uh, keep an eye out for the upgrade coming soon and we hope you enjoy Apex 21.2 on Autonomous. Now I'm going to change gears and go into this optional extension to the Vanity URL architecture from last time. And I'm going to start off with a slide from last time. If you're new to Autonomous Database, it's not only a database, it comes with all kinds of other things. Uh, and it has multiple interfaces to your data. There's the SQL Net interface, there's the HTTP interface, all kinds of goodies included with Autonomous. And if you're on this call, perhaps you know a little bit about Apex, right? This is a key piece of the what's offered over the HTTP interface. You get Apex prepackaged, pre-configured, and included through Autonomous Database. We maintain it, we upgrade it, we patch it, we do all that kind of stuff. And it's a great place to go get your low-code apps and run your low-code apps and develop your low-code apps. Autonomous Database on the bottom, this is kind of obscured, but the the ORDS environment also gives you some great stuff. You can stand up custom REST endpoints. You can automatically create REST endpoints. It gives you a SQL over REST interface. You can send arbitrary SQL and get back JSON. And it gives you a bunch of tools we collectively refer to as database actions, a nice web-based or browser-based IDE. We call it SQL Developer Web for creating SQL scripts and PL SQL, PL SQL scripts. It gives you some nice tools for loading data, managing database users. Lots to love about the Oracle REST data services component of this as well. Now, all these things, including Apex and everything from ORDS, are by default exposed at a domain name called oraclecloudapps.com and using an Oracle uh, certificate. So when you you stand up and run an Apex app, or you stand up and run a REST endpoint using these technologies. By default, they're exposed on the public internet at oraclecloudapps.com using the Oracle certificate. And what we found is that's great for a lot of use cases, you know, things that are for a smaller audience. Maybe you're standing up something for a group of employees or a group of business partners. Running it at this default domain name is, is you know, is just fine. You don't necessarily need to do a lot of branding to your own employees or to your own uh, contractors or business partners. And we have many customers who are very happily running Apex apps at this default domain. However, more and more, we have a lot of customers asking about, hey, I want to use my own domain name, right? I'm standing up an Apex app for a business purpose. I'm, you know, I'm doing my own stuff and I do want to do some branding to this public audience. It's not necessarily employees, it's customers, it's end users. I want to do branding to them. I want them to see my domain name in the browser address bar as they're using that Apex app at all times, right? So there's legitimate use case here. And that's what we're talking about when we say vanity URLs. Uh, it's the ability to stand up Apex apps and ORDS REST endpoints at your own domain name and using your own certificate instead of these uh, defaults. Okay, so that's the primer. We, we covered this uh, mostly last time. So let's drill into some use cases for multiple vanity URLs. And this is multiple, you've got multiple custom domain names serving potentially multiple apps on the same underlying autonomous database. So why would you want to do this? Of course, there are scenarios where you got 
distinct apps that have a distinct brand. And uh, you know, perhaps the apps are, are, they are, they are for a narrower, narrower audience, but you still want them to see the brand. And you could potentially run multiple apps on the same autonomous database, that's fine. But you've gotta, you've gotta have distinct domain names for each of those apps. So uh, many people asked about that. Someone asked specifically about this at the last session. That's kind of the leading use case. There are a couple other use cases that are worth pointing out. You may have dev test copies of an application. Uh, uh, for example, I put a quick example here. You've got a production app that you want to expose on the public internet at your domain. And then you've got a copy of it for testing purposes, like a, a beta test or something that you want to expose at a subdomain like beta.example.com or preview.example.com. So you've got multiple copies of the same app that you want to potentially expose at different domains. Another one is you've got apps that are, they're not just Apex or they're not just ORDs. They're apps that are combined UI and API applications. So there's a UI interactive component to it uh, provided as a low code app in Apex at your base domain, example.com. But you're also giving something to developer audiences in the form of an API working on that same data in the same autonomous database. And you might want to expose that at a different subdomain, something like api.example.com. And you've probably seen things like this, you know, right now. There's lots, lots of uh, examples of this. Okay, so there, so there's some use cases that are of interest. I want to point out this is not an exhaustive list of all the possibilities. Uh, there are other similar use cases that can be supported. And all the concepts I'm going to show today can be applied very similar to any of these use cases. In addition, maybe it's obvious here, but they, this works for both Apex apps and ORDS REST endpoints running on your autonomous databases. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to focus rather specifically on number one here, use case number one. This is the big one, probably the most common one that's asked about. And if you can do number one, then you can, you can configure number two and number three as well. In fact, if you're doing number two and number three, there's some places you can kind of uh, cut some corners and do it a little easier. Uh, but I'm going to focus on number one so you get the full picture and uh, <clears throat> we're answering kind of the, the, the most common question. All right. So a couple prerequisites. First off, I, I'm, and I'm going to demo this, you'll see it live running in the cloud in, in just a few moments. But first off, you need to have that base vanity URL configuration from last time, from the prior office hours. Uh, you, should, you should have kind of gone through that and have a, a functioning single vanity URL set up. Secondly, you need to have that additional domain. We're going to do this with a second domain now, running on the same autonomous database. So you need to have an additional domain that you control. Last time, for demo purposes, I was using a domain called tbotker.com. It's a personal domain that I own and I control. I actually have a second one much like this that I own and I control and I use for demo purposes. I stand it up and I take it down periodically and I do demos on it and stuff like that. That one's called botkertech.com. So you'll see that in a moment. We need to have two domains that you control. Also for that second new domain that we're introducing into the mix, you need to have a SSL TLS certificate bundle for that. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. We kind of assume you know how to generate certificates for domain names kind of assume that you have that, but you, you got to have that uh, certificate bundle at hand for your second domain name, because you'll use that. You need to have a DNS A record for the second domain as well. Last time we showed setting up the A record, closing the loop, actually loading this up in a browser, we, we kind of showed all that. We're gonna, you need to have a second DNS record also pointing to your same load balancer, which is in front of your autonomous database at your load balancer's public IP address. I actually have a screenshot of that coming up. I'll show that in a minute. And then lastly, last prerequisite, prerequisite is you need to have a second Apex application. So last time I showed really quickly creating a sample app and then exposing it on your vanity URL, uh, you need to have a second Apex app that we can expose on the second vanity URL. So I'm not going to go through recreating an app from scratch again. I kind of pre-created that. All right, so this is the, this is the DNS stuff. Last time I, I was using my own personal tbotker.com 
domain for experimenting and demo purposes. And I'm pointing it to this public IP address here, 132.226.115.43. So that's the public IP of the load balancer sitting in front of my autonomous database. This time I'm going to use a second one that I personally own, botgertech.com. And I've pre-configured this pointing to the same public IP address. It takes a while for these DNS changes to propagate across the globe. Uh, so, you know, I did this ahead of time. But it's the same, we're basically using the same IP address. These are screenshots from the uh, DNS that I happen to be using. Uh, personally, it's named cheap, if you've ever seen that before, but don't misconstrue this as any sort of endorsement for Namecheap or any other service like this. It just happens to be the one I'm using. Okay, so the second prerequisite is your second Apex app. Last time I created this little projects app, it was, it's just using the uh, packaged projects and tasks data set that comes along with Apex. Uh, there's another packaged data set about all about world population and population trends. This comes packaged with Apex as well. So I just stood up a really simple sample app that uses that data set. It's already there and, and ready to go, and I called it population. So those are two prereqs where I, I kind of cheated, I guess, and did, did those in advance to save a little time. Okay, so now this is the architecture diagram that we ended, <clears throat> excuse me, that we ended on last time. Um, hold on just one second. I'm going to take a drink. Okay, so this is the architecture diagram we ended on last time. It shows the final solution. We've got our autonomous database on the bottom and a private subnet. We've got a load balancer sitting in front of it in a public subnet. All this is wrapped in the VCN. You can see my DNS in the top right, uh, my certificate. This is all the stuff that was, was already there if, if, if you followed through the previous session. And I wanna point out too, since then, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI, has come out with a very nice network diagramming capability. Uh, so I showed you setting up the VCN, setting up the subnets, doing all that stuff manually by drilling in and zooming out. And since then, they've actually created a visual way to look at this. So you can, you can produce diagrams that, kind of, that look something like this directly in OCI, and you can navigate around your resources by navigating around a diagram. So take a look at that if you if you haven't already seen that kind of nice capability to show all these resources visually. Okay, so this time I'm going to focus on this area of the diagram and we're going to zoom in on that. And these are the things that are new or different for supporting multiple vanity URLs for multiple apps on the same autonomous database. In the top right, you see my DNS with the uh, two records pointing to the same load balancer we showed that. On the bottom left, you see my autonomous database running my two, now two Apex apps, a projects app and a population app. And I wanna have, uh, in this setup, I want to have tbotker.com, my first domain name, open up the projects app and only the projects app. And this new domain name that I'm introducing into the mix, botkertech.com, I want to have that open up the populations app and only the population app. So that's, that's the setup I'm going for. And for demo purposes, I'm gonna kind of focus on what's in the middle, the load balancer stuff. I'll show you how to configure the load balancer stuff. That tends to be what's a little new or a little different for Apex developers. So I'm gonna show all this um, in, a, in a real running environment. But basically what you're doing is what was one listener for your load balancer now becomes two listeners for your load balancer. And you're, you're narrowing each of those listeners. So one's picking up tbotker.com and the other listener is picking up botkertech.com. Uh, you of course have to upload your new certificate for your, your no, new domain as well. I, I previously had uploaded the certificate bundle for tbotker.com into one listener. So now for the new listener, I'm gonna to need to upload the certificate bundle for botkertech.com and I'll, I'll show you where that is. But this is the basic idea is what was one listener, uh, you're splitting out into two listeners. We also showed some rule sets that are enforced by the listener and we're going to need to adapt the rule set from last time a little bit. In fact, we'll start on that note. 
Uh, you need to define some things called some host name objects in your load balancer. But all of this is, it's not particularly um, challenging. With a couple tips, a normal person can do it. You don't need to be super networking expert to do it. A normal person can do this, and, and, I'll, and I'll show this to you in a minute. This is a high level view of the steps. You go into your load balancer, you update the existing rule set. Uh, we're going to split it out actually and, and make more than one rule set now. You create some of these host name objects, you upload your new certificate. You go to your existing listener from last time and narrow it to this host name of your original domain. Previously, it was listening to everything. It wasn't filtering by host. It was just listening to everything. So we're gonna narrow it now. Then you create a new listener. Um, you set it to the, the host name of the new domain and upload the new certificate to it. And then you've got this dual listener configuration that can service your two do domains. Uh, lastly, we're going to take this all the way across the finish line too and tighten it up a little bit so you don't run in any cross domain kind of issues. There's a short PL SQL script that you can attach to your Apex apps to, to tighten it up and I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Okay, so now I'm going to change the screen share here. We'll go to my browser and we'll, uh, we'll start configuring. Here we go. Okay, hopefully you can see my browser now. Shakib, stop me if this is not coming through. <laughs> Looks great. Hopefully, hopefully this is visible. Okay, here's my vanity URL load balancer from last time. I'll just start by drilling into it. And you can see here, this is that public IP address of the, of the load balancer. Uh, excuse me, this is my load balancer from last time. And here's the public IP address of the load balancer. Scroll down here, you can see uh, listeners, rule sets, host names. And I have pre-configured much of this, so you don't have to sit and wait for a cloud change to commit each time I make a change. That takes 10 to 20 seconds each time. So I have pre-configured much of this. And then I just kind of walk you through what I've pre-configured, and then I'll show you it running. Uh, live. So the first thing was making some adaptations to your pre-existing rule set. Last time we set up this rule set called ADB Public Access, and we, there were a couple things in there. There was a rule that adds a header, uh, and Apex then picks up on this header. Whenever it's present, it blocks access to dev tools or and admin tools, things like admin services and app builder uh, that we don't necessarily want to be exposed at the vanity URL. We only want the runtimes, only the app, runtime apps and rest endpoints. That's what we want exposed to the vanity URL, but not necessarily all the dev tools. So we had a little um, rule set here that was sending a header to signal Apex to block dev and admin tools. And we also had another rule that effectively sets the home page or the home app for the domain to that project's app. This little URL redirect rule, it picks up on the base path and redirects you to that project's app. So it's effectively setting the home app or home page for the domain. So we had both of those in the same rule set. Now what I've done is, let me show you this. I've, uh, oops, go back here. I've split it out now so that this public access rule set is only the header piece, right? It sets the header to block the Apex dev tools and does nothing else. So now I can reuse it as I'm setting up multiple domains because I've narrowed it a little bit. And the other rule that was setting the default Apex app for the domain, I put that in something called home t botker. I'll show you that really quick. This is the, just what we did last time. We always add ORDs to the end of your base domain name. You'll see that as you're loading up pages, you'll see it flash across. So that's kind of your base path is domain name slash ORDs. And then whenever we see that, we're going to redirect to this shortcut that uses the app alias projects. This is the Apex app alias. And we basically load up this project's app by default. 
whenever you're going to the base URL. Okay, so that's all stuff from last time. I just split it out into two. The second thing I did was I took this home for T Botker and I made a duplicate of it. Home for Botker Tech. This is my new domain. And I basically did the same thing for my new domain. I look for the base path. And in this case, I want to redirect to the population app, not the projects app. Remember, because I want tbotker.com to show the population app and only the population app. Or excuse me, I want Botker Tech to show the population app and only the population app. And I want tbotker to show the projects app and only the projects app. And so I'm setting that base app for my second domain here. Okay, so a couple tweaks to the setup of the rule sets. The next thing I want to point out is the host names. This part's really simple. This is net new. You've got to create some of these host name objects in your load balancer, and there's not a whole lot to them. It's just informing load balancer that there is a host name that looks like this that we're going to make use of. And then also informing the load balancer that there's a host name that looks like this that we're going to make use of. So this is my prior one from the prior config. And I also added one for Botker Tech for the new domain. So that's the host names. And then the certificates, you jump over here. I have to drill into load balancer, manage certificates. There is a way to manage certificates for all kinds of OCI stuff centrally. Now there's a central certificate management service. Um, it's a little newer, more contemporary. I had previously started down the path of just using load balancer certificate management. So this is specific to the load balancer instance. And just for continuity, I'm going to stick with that this time because I previously I was having load balancer manage the certificate. So I'm still doing that. This is my certificate from last time for my tbotker.com domain. And this is my certificate information that's new for my new Botker Tech domain. So I, I had to upload this new stuff here and create a certificate object to house that. And then listeners. Okay, so these are the listeners for my load balancer. This is the uh, previous one we set up and I just tweaked its name a little bit so I can visually see that this is the one I'm going to use for tbotker but other than that it's it's basically the same thing we set up last time um, let me open that kind of walk you through that so this is my original listener it's listening for HTTPS on 443 it's using my original certificate tbotker and um, oh I'm sorry here's the new thing so I narrowed this to this tbotker.com host, this host names field that says optional. I actually selected the host name that I showed you a minute ago. That's net new. So that effectively narrows this listener. So it's listening specifically for things that are coming out of that host name, tbotker.com. So I added that. The rest of this is all the same. You can see the rule set here. This sets the base app for tbotker to that. Um, projects app. And then normally I would have that ADB public access rule set here as well to block access to the dev tools. Normally you'd have that here. This is what enforces it is by making the listener aware of it. I'm going to actually need to log in to app builder in a few minutes. So I've removed that rule set here, but we're going to, we can add it back in later. For now I removed it, but we can add it back in later. Okay. So that's, the existing one and then this is the new one I created a net new listener for Botker tech and again HTTPS listening on 443 I selected the new certificate I selected the host name for botkertech.com to kind of narrow it to botkertech.com it's pointing to the same back end set as last time which ultimately solves to my autonomous database with a private IP address so both listeners ultimately are routing to the same backend and same backend set. Um, and I did the same thing here. I selected the rule set that sets the default app for botkertech.com to my population app. And I omitted the ADB public access rule set just for now, because I actually do need to get to app builder to show you some things as part of this demo. And that's a quick way to get to it is just through the vanity rule. So I disabled that temporarily, but we'll add it back in. Okay, so that's my list. Those are my two listeners that I've set up now. And let me just make sure I think I've showed you everything now the rule sets, the listeners, the certificates, and the host names. So now, 
this is a live uh, running environment. And if I go to uh, yes, tvotker.com, you see that a uh, listener woke up, it ran the rule set that with the URL redirect rule that loads my project apps. So I get my projects runtime app at my base URL. Everything's looking good there. Now let's go to the second one. This is the new domain. Same thing, the, the correct listener woke up, processed that inbound request. It ended up doing some redirecting per the rule set to load this populations app. This is my runtime populations app. So everything looks good. So now we've got two custom domain names servicing two distinct Apex apps on the same underlying autonomous database. So you might say, okay, we're good, we're good, we're done. But actually there's a kind of tricky thing I wanted to point out here where if you know what you're doing and you happen to surmise that these two domain names are being served by the same autonomous database, you can kind of hack your way around this and you can get to other apps at domain names you're not supposed to, right? So I happen to know that this is also running an app with an alias called Projects. I can go to Projects and get to the Projects app at botkertech.com. So we've got, if I just left it right there, it's working, but we've got a little bit of a cross domain issue here now, right? So, and it's not as bad as it sounds, right? You think uh, cross site scripting, cross domain attacks, blah, blah, blah. You know, those are things where you're, skipping domains to attack distinct software stacks. In this case, they're all running on the same software stack under the covers. It just, it's optically, it, it could be confusing, right? And a user could stumble across this. Who knows, I don't know, maybe it does, it could potentially open up security issues we don't want that hackers will find out about later. In any case, we wanna prohibit this, right? We wanna close this off and there's a way to do that so you can't, jump apps across domains like this. So that's where I'm going to take it across the finish line and we're going to um, show you uh, how to how to solve this with the very simple snippet of script in your app. Okay, so now remember I left the dev tools unblocked so that I can get to them. So now I'm going to uh, grab my shortcut here and actually log into my workspace and make some simple changes to the apps. All right, so now I'm in App Builder. I can see my Projects app. If I drill into my Projects app, and if you're an Apex developer, you, you do stuff like this pretty regularly. This probably look familiar. I'm in my Projects app right now. I'm gonna to go to its properties. And notice under the Security tab, perhaps you've used this, you have the opportunity to run an initialization script before the app is fully loaded and presented and rendered, we can run a little initialization script. So right here, what I'm going to do is check and see what domain I'm coming in on and make sure the domain I'm coming in on is in fact tbotker, right? Because I only want that project's app visible on tbotker. So I've got a little script to do that, and this will appear in a blog post shortly. So you'll have access to this script. There's nothing particularly complex about it. I'm just checking at runtime, what's the host I'm coming in on using this OWA util get CGI end call? What's the host I'm coming in on? And then if the host I'm coming in on is not tbotker, I want to redirect you using Apex util redirect URL. It's another commonly used uh, 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 package here, Apex util. So if you're not coming in on tbotker, you're coming in on botker tech. I'm going to redirect you to something that says ORDs blocked. So you'll get a 404 and you'll see in the URL this message, you know, basically, it's basically a signal indicating you've been deliberately blocked. So now my, the app itself is going to check what domain I'm coming in on. And if you're not coming out of the domain that I want for that app, it's going to block you. So we'll apply changes there. And I'm going to do the same thing for my populations app. With application properties, go to the security tab, scroll down to the initialization PL SQL code. I'm going to grab a little script for that too. It's basically the same script. The only thing I'm changing now is I'm checking to ensure that we're coming in on Botker Tech. And if I'm not coming in on Botker Tech, I'm coming in on Tbotker or something else, I'm going to block it. 
slight, slight changes there. And we'll sign out. So now let's go back in and repeat this. Uh, I'll just go to my base, tbotker.com. I get my projects app. But now if I try to get to the other Apex app running on that same autonomous database, called population. Now you'll see you get a 404 and it says orgs blocked. So we've closed down this potential cross domain issue with a couple of very simple script uh, snippets added to my Apex apps. Okay, so that's it for the multi-domain part. Um, I want to take a, just a couple minutes to show you this second extension now. So I'm going to change gears and uh, for the final time and talk a little bit about the second extension. So in the last session, we showed that uh, header rule to block access to the Apex dev tools at your vanity URL. We showed you a couple other things. Uh, as I recall, I showed you a, a simple rule you could use to block REST enabled SQL. Which, um, you know, we start kind of started down this path, but ran out of time. And I didn't give you a very comprehensive view. Uh, so since then, I've published this blog post, and I'll show the links in a moment to all the blogs that are relevant here. This is a, a new blog post that gives you that more comprehensive view. So these are all the things that are exposed by ORDs in your autonomous database by default that you may want to consider locking down at your vanity URL. Again, this is optional, so it's up to you. But if you want the comprehensive list of things to lock down, this is it. It's all in this table here. And there's 10 or so endpoints that you may want to lock down. Um, by default, I would suggest locking these things down. Only leave them open if you need them for some reason. Now, by default, the situation isn't as bad as you may think. These endpoints are there and they're visible. Some of them return some relatively innocuous JSON. But to do anything with them, you do have to authenticate, right? They're not just left completely open, right? So to do anything with these endpoints, you still have to go in and authenticate. They're not completely out there. But nonetheless, you may want to just completely hide them with some simple uh, URL redirect rules in your load balancer. So you can very easily create your own redirect rules for each one of these things. And then the load balancer is shielding them completely from your end users who are at the vanity URL. So I'm not going to do all of these. I think maybe I'll just do one of them for demo purposes, for example purposes. This is, um, this is an API that's there by default in the autonomous database. It allows you to automate ORDs itself. Right? So ORDs itself provides an API that allows you to do some things. It's a Rust API. Um, so you can script to ORDs itself and do some things. You, of course, do have to authenticate before you can do anything meaningful. But if I just go to this, um, if I just go to this right now, you'll see it does uh, return some JSON. And I'm going to go at admin. So this is uh, the default admin account that comes with my autonomous database. It's the only account that's web enabled by default. You can web enable uh, other users, other schemas as you go along, in which case you'll need to create rules for each of these. Uh, right now, I just this is the key one. So I'm going to go here. And you can see, so it does return some JSON right now. I'd have to authenticate to actually cause this API to do things. But I probably want to block this so you don't, you don't even see it. Okay, so I'll take this and just show you a really simple URL redirect rule for this one, and you can kind of infer how to do it for the other ones. And I'll, and I'll add this to my ADB public access rule set as a URL redirect rule. I'm going to search for slash ords and then ending in DB API. This is the API for for ORDs. In this case, I'm going to use a prefix match. If I web enable other users and access this at other web enabled schemas later, I'll, add, I'll need to add other prefix matches that look like this. Right now, I really just have an admin and demo, so I'm going to just do it for admin right now. And then I'm going to redirect to something that looks like this, kind of signaling to the user that this was deliberately blocked then save changes. It'll take a second 
Um, no, sometimes it's between 10 and 20 seconds is usually what I've seen. This is how this is where it's going and fully committing that change to Oracle Cloud and you get a little waiting message while that's happening. So give me just a couple seconds for that to finish. You'll see it change to succeeded. There we go. Okay, so now I have a rule to block this. If I just refresh. Oh, did I do something wrong there? Oh, I might have done that for Botker Tech. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I know the problem. I didn't go back and add the rule set to the listener. So let me do that. Remember, I, I dropped the ADB public access, access rule set from the listener so that I could get to the uh, Apex Workspace login. Now I need to make sure it's back on the uh, listener. There we go. There's my listener. Okay. So I'm going to go, let's just do this on T Botker. Yeah. Edit. Add rule set ADB public access. So now that should be getting actually enforced for T Botker. We'll give this a second to finish. And then we're, then we're done. Okay, so all right, now that my listener is actually enforcing it, <laughs> now I'll refresh and you'll see I get a 404 and I see in my URL that, hey, this was deliberately blocked. So you can do something very similar for everything in this table. Uh, just check the blog, take a look at this table. You can read all about what, e what each endpoint does and uh, up to you. Uh, if it were me, I would by default block all these things and only open them up if I need them for a specific reason. You may need to expose the SOTA API for REST and so on and so uh, There's a question here, if a generic rule can be created for all slash underscore slash. For all slash underscore slash. Um, if, it's, if there's not a schema name in the path, then usually you can just do a suffix match and you can handle it with a single rule. If it's something where there is a schema name in the path, then you need to do a prefix match and you would do it for any of the users that you have specifically web enabled. You've made, you've made them web enabled users. And that usually is a subset of all the users. It's not all your users, it's just the ones you've web enabled. But in that case, yeah, you usually, you would use prefix match. You can fool around with this yourself. There's a couple other pattern matching things you can do. But I, I spent a, a fair amount of time on this, I think. Most of the time I had to do a prefix match with the schema name in the path. But many of these, you actually don't have a schema name in the path, right? So you can just do it with a single suffix match rule. I don't know. Does that answer the question? Um, I think, I I'm think it does. Sure. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay. I have another, I have a couple of other questions here as well. Here, uh, Shakib, just one. while we're doing Q and A, I'm yep. going to uh, switch over really quickly and show the slide with a bunch of helpful links. Give me just a second and then we'll, we'll get sure. back to the Q&A here. Uh, okay, hopefully you can see um, my PowerPoint again. And okay, so these are all the links, blog posts. Uh, we have some videos now, video recordings now that have come out of the Apex office hours. Uh, other general links that will be helpful. Okay, go ahead, other questions? Yep. So I have one. Um, will it be possible in the future that uh, Let's Encrypt will be implemented to renew the certificate automatically? Ah, okay. That's that's a great question. So in this demo, I was using the load balancer certificate management because that's where I started, just just for continuity. But there's this newer, more contemporary centralized certificate management in OCI. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. I read through the doc. I twiddled with it a little bit. It's very powerful. So if you're storing your certificates in the central certificate management, it does give you an opportunity to set reminders and dangle a little certificate renewal script off of your certificate that's managed there. So from what I can tell, I didn't personally do this, but it does give you a way to automate that certificate renewal. You can set reminders, put a script there, you know, whatever Let's Encrypt 
your Acme you know, thing you're using to generate the certificate, you can script to that cert bot, you can script to that. And um, I believe there is a way you can automate that now end to end. But the key point is you have to be using the centralized certificate management service and not the default one that just comes with your load balancer. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, there's one more. Um, you mentioned OCI's uh, central certificate management service. Uh, what are the benefits of using that? Ah, yes, very similar question. It's <laughs> just, uh, you, get, you get extra special sauce and I can't enumerate all the things you get. It's a pretty robust service. I'd encourage you to go take a look at it. it that's, it's a little bit outside of my domain. We have PMs that are just for that. Uh, but I did notice, yeah, one of the things it does is it allows you to dangle a renewal script off of your certificate. Mm -hmm. So you do have a way to audit, but it's, it's much more than that too. There's lots of additional goodies you get when you okay. manage them there. So. Um, I have another one. This one just came in. Um, I missed the point how that certificate got available in that drop down. Like where did you set it from? Oh, I ha you have to, um, when you're using the load balancer certificate management, you, you upload the certificate into your load balancer and it creates like a certificate object now to track the files that constitute that certificate bundle. So I, you explicitly create a certificate object in load balancer. It's got the certificate bundle files attached to it. And then in your listener, you select the certificate object that you want. So in that second listener I configured for botkertech.com, my new domain, I did that kind of quick, I guess. Yeah, maybe I should have spent more time with that. But there's a drop down where you select the certificate object you want for that listener. And I selected the new one that has the botkertech.com bundle associated with it. It's a, it's a single drop down in the uh, listener edit dialog, basically. All right. Uh, I have another one here. Um, in the multiple vanity URLs configuration, uh, is there a way to solve the cross-domain issue using only Apex, like uh, native Apex components capabilities, like no PL SQL snippets? Okay, so that's another really good question. Uh, I gave you a really short PL SQL snippet you can put and run as part of the initial app initialization. Uh, there is a capability in Apex, and, and you see this on-premises when you have Apex running on-premises. Um, it's under the security tab. There's there's uh, an instance level allow host names. And there's also a workspace level allow host names capability uh, where you can narrow a given workspace and all the apps in that workspace only to a certain inbound host name. Okay, so that's part of Apex right now, and you get that with an on-premise or uh, you know or a install of Apex that you own end to end in autonomous database. Uh, we haven't enabled that yet. We, we enabled the, the instance level allow host names, but not the workspace level allow host names. That is on our roadmap, okay? So you should see that appearing in autonomous database in the fairly near future. And once you can set the host name at the workspace level, then yeah, you can do this all without any PL SQL scripting, right? Because what you can do is you can go into a setting, say for this particular workspace, I only want to allow this host name, and then the apps that you want to expose at that host name are only in that workspace. Then you have another workspace for another host name and the apps that you want to expose at that host name are in the other workspace. It allows you to do this click, click, click instead mm -hmm. of with PL SQL scripts, uh, snippets. So yes, that it's, that's there on premise. It's not there in autonomous right now, but it is on our roadmap. Keep an eye out for that. It is coming soon. Then you'll have a way to do this without, without any script at all. Sounds good. I think we're running out of time, so we can wrap it up. Hey, thanks so much, Todd, for the session. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending this Office Hours. Of course, you can watch the replay as well by going to apexoracle.com slash office hours. We'll have it up in a few days. Uh, thank you all so much for attending, and we hope to see you next time.